and Prosodic Patterns of Turn-Taking and Japanese Conversation. I'm Nigel Ward. This is a presentation for Speech Prosody 2020. However, thanks to the coronavirus, you can watch it as a video without trans traveling to Tokyo, without even doing any time travel. It's being recorded, but we also have a live audience here. Hello. Hey, and at the end, we'll take questions. All right. Let me start with an audio clip that illustrates Japanese turn-taking. <laughs> okay, I imagine that if you're a Japanese speaker, that sounded totally natural. If you don't speak Japanese, it probably sounded a little bit foreign or strange. What underlies both of those perceptions? So here's what they're saying. The words are not so important here, but the prosody is what, what counts. Let me play again a little clip focusing on this part. So she does something interesting with her voice. See if you can tell what it is, and if you can guess it, great. Otherwise, I'll let you know after a few slides. Okay, here it is. <laughs> All right, she's doing something that gets a response. Okay, so stepping back. So human turn-taking is really pretty amazing. So if you think about Siri and Alexa, their turn-taking is not so amazing. It sort of gets the job done, right? There's not too much overlap. There's not too much awkward pauses, but you know, it's just not rewarding. People in normal conversation have a lot more fun. They do turn taking in all sorts of interesting ways. They establish rapport, they tease each other, they play games. How is that done? So this talk is about how that's done specifically for one language. And are turn taking structures universal or do they vary from language to language? So those are the motivating questions. All right, the talk is, um, some background and motivation, a little bit on the data and the methods, and then a few of the 10 patterns themselves. In terms of motivation, well, the global motivation is that turn-taking is fascinating, it's important for success in conversation, it's good for making systems more effective. Uh, my personal reasons, though, are, well, 25 years ago, as an assistant professor at the University of Tokyo, sorry about that, I was looking at back-channeling, the prosody of back-channeling. So I figured out that back-channeling in Japanese is often cued by a region of low pitch. Very good. But what are all the other things in back turn taking? Nobody really worked on this in the way that I wanted them to work on it, describing all the specific details for the past 25 years. So having enough data and better methods, I came back to take another look. Um, when I say nobody worked on it, that's a gross exaggeration. Uh, let me just talk about previous research. So previous research has looked at all different aspects of turn-taking, but from a certain perspective. Almost all of it takes the perspective that you have speaker A and speaker B, and either has A has the turn or B has the turn. At certain points, A will do something to signal that he's yielding the turn to B, or B will do something to signal that they're using, yielding the turn to A. So this is the classic model. And with this classic model, um, Anything that doesn't fit the model, you just sort of like throw that away, not interesting. Um, and you focus on the little stars. Right? So what are the signals that A does to yield the turn? And within that, the classic focus has been on the final syllable and on the two prosodic features, pitch and lengthening. So for example, I say, oh, I'm doing okay, and how are you doing today? Right? So great slowing on the last syllable, very low pitch on the last syllable. It'll never often really be that extreme in normal conversation, but in English, uh, Japanese, Mandarin, other languages, that sort of thing is part of the basic structure of turn-taking. But that's not all there is to it. So rather than a two-state model, here we're going to take the perspective that turn-taking is about anything relating to who speaks when. So if people are speaking over each other, that's interesting. If there's awkward pauses, that's interesting. Anything that relates to any of those things. And instead of just signals, joint patterns. So if two people do something together, how do they do that? Instead of looking just at the final syllable, consider wider contexts, up to three seconds in the past and future. And instead of two prosodic features, focus on everything I can ready detect her for. Uh, loudness, rate, creakiness, reduction versus articulatory precision. Uh, so this is sort of coming from a theoretical perspective based on work by Ogden and Niebuhr, and uh, sort of summarized in a book by myself last year. 
But the idea of a prosodic construction is that in conversation, people use these prosodic constructions, which are mappings from form to function. The forms involve many prosodic features, organized as patterns in time, and they may involve patterns by two people, two participants. The functions are quite diverse. So very concisely, uh, the methods that I used was a data-driven method. Um, so using the Japanese call home corpus, I selected 14 telephone conversations, fragments of conversations, two hours in total, and threw that into my model to come up with the patterns. Uh, sorry? Yeah, yeah. So what dialect was this data from? OK, so the call home corpus is across all the islands of Japan. Um, I th excluded conversations which I couldn't understand, which meant that in practice, the 14 conversations used here were either from Tokyo or something that was reasonably close to Tokyo, uh, mostly excluding Kansai and Kyushu dialects. So it's, uh, the, the purpose of the research here was not to focus on one specific dialect, sort of on the general Japanese tendency uh, excluding some dialects. Yeah. So across that data, sampled a lot of data points, computed a lot of prosaic features, threw it into principal component analysis to make sense of it all, and it yields patterns, which I interpret. So let's just look at one together. So this is what the mathematical process throws out, an example of one of the patterns it discovers. Um, so on the x-axis, you'll see time. Time here is in milliseconds. On the y-axis, you see 14 prosodic features, uh, some for speaker A and some for speaker B. So across all of those data points, this is a pattern that often comes up. Uh, if you look at the first line, the purple line for speaker A, you'll notice that it's kind of above zero. It's above the thin horizontal line for some time. And then it goes below. For speaker B, that top green line, the loudness or intensity is below zero, then it goes up. So we can say, aha, we've discovered a pattern of turn taking. A yields the turn to B. So we can call this the basic turn exchange pattern. Okay, that's kind of interesting, but what exactly is, can we say about the details? All right, very classic turn exchange here. Okay, and if you want to go back and play it again, you'll be able to hear that the yielding person yields with a low pitch, some lengthening, and some creaky voice. And the person who comes in with a new turn comes in at a higher pitch and some lengthening. Now, the detailed temporal structure, you can read that after the diagram. I'm not going to make a big deal about that here. Um, ignoring that, this is something that confirms what previous research has found. So nothing is original or surprising here. But the mathematical procedure I described is indeed successful at discovering you know, turn structures that are known. It can also discover back channel pattern, another well-known turn structure. Uh, there's a little more detail here than you usually see in the descriptions of the back channeling pattern. Um, so it starts out with some lengthening, creaky voice, low pitch, then the back channel. Here it would be n, And then the back channel is always lengthened, falling pitch, creaky. And then the person who's received the back channel goes ahead and continues with high pitch and lengthening. So let's play in the clip. So, 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 OK, very classic pattern. So what he's doing is he's expressing some information. She acknowledges it and shows that she's ready for the next piece of information. And then he delivers on the really exciting information based on the plot of this movie. Let me play that again. So, 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 OK, so the prosody marks the pattern, and the pattern serves the function. Here's another pattern. Uh, I'll just play it straight off. <laughs> Alright, here she's holding the floor. Right in the middle she says something like da 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 Okay, so there's a nice smooth pitch declination and there's sort of a rhythm. Her pace is kind of slow and that's one way to hold the floor. Right? It would be rude and improper for him to interrupt at any point, even though in general in conversations you'd come in a lot of places. So this is the pattern used to hold the floor. Other closest to turn taking is another pattern. So here A is talking at the beginning, and after th three or four seconds, B is talking. Okay, but instead of a simple turn exchange, there's some dancing around that happens in the middle. Little particles come in. Uh, B shows a willingness to take the turn. B 
A shows a willingness to yield the turn, and it sounds like this. Okay, so here she's actually making a question which she responds to. That's sort of incidental to this pattern. It happens in many, many contexts. Um, and it's usually used compared to the basic turn exchange pattern to sort of change the topic or change the floor or move the conversation in a new direction. Other patterns which I won't have time to talk about, topic enthusiasm, lack of a topic, the filler pattern, turn initial pauses, rapid turn interleaving are described in the paper. And you can also find audio clips on the website. I'll give you the URL at the end. OK, so now we're ready to explain that first example again. So uh, let me play it again and listen to what she's saying, how she pronounces the words Nihonjin. Oh, well, here, I'll tell you how she pronounces them. It's in high pitch, a rather wide pitch range, and good articulatory precision. She enunciates those, those syllables. In return, she gets a response uh, about 600 milliseconds later, more or less. <laughs> okay, so I call this the commentable information pattern because she's throwing out something, expecting him to agree or disagree. Here, he's doing a nice, polite performer disagreement. A couple other examples of the same pattern. Um, uh, okay, shaku, shaku dakara. He says the word twice. Why does he say it twice? I'm guessing that the first time didn't have the force. It didn't have the quite the prosodic punch that he wanted. So he said it again. Um, so he's making a claim about something being you know, annoying or bothersome or not worth the effort. Um, and here it is in the larger context. <laughs> I said that this evokes a comment. And here the comment is, uh? So of course, speakers have the freedom to follow through, the, through on the patterns or to mix it up or change things or add things. Uh, so they don't always follow these patterns rigidly. But these are the basic patterns of the language. Another more classic example uh, follows. Okay, so the B speaker says, right? All right. Again, he's calling for a comment. Here it is in the context. <laughs> okay, all right, so there's a pattern. All right, so the paper describes 10 patterns of behavior in Japanese. And having applied the exact same procedure to English and Mandarin, I can tell you that some of these occur with great similarity in all languages, and some don't. Uh, sorry. Go ahead. Japanese yeah. and English are different in so many ways. So how can they be similar in these patterns? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the prosody of Japanese and English is very different if you look at like the words, right? But there's the analogy of going out to the pond, and you see the big waves, and you see the little ripples on top of the waves. So the little ripples, like the little word ripples of the prosody, those are different. Um, but sometimes the big patterns, the big patterns of the waves can be very similar, um, not entirely the same. And sometimes they can be quite different. So back channeling in Japanese uh, comes in much faster than it does in English, even though the prosody, many aspects of the prosody are the same. But I guess the point I want to make with this slide is it's not universal. And so if you're one of those people, uh, not, not to be too pejorative, but if you like to come up with a theory and then flesh out the details of your theory by looking at language A, language B, language C, uh, you're likely to miss some interesting things. Languages really do differ. All right, well, 10 prosodic patterns of turn-taking in Japanese conversation finally identified. The details are there in the paper. Um, Data-driven methods are valuable, and they're not universal. Uh, there's the URL for the full paper and more examples. You can shoot me an email if you have any questions or comments. And uh, But we do have one minute left for questions right now. So what exactly is this good for? What's the application? Right. Well, one application would be people who want to learn Japanese. So when I learned Japanese, uh, the only thing I was told about turn-taking is you got to back channel more often in Japanese than in English. That was it. <laughs> I took Japanese classes for eight years. Um, uh, so I think it would be great if teachers of Japanese could come up with more materials now that we do know what the patterns are and help lots of learners. Uh, and the other application is, is robots and dialect systems. So if you're happy with like a kind of cold, standoffish, arm's length interaction with Siri, that's great. If you want your robots to be robotic, that's great. But there may be applications where you want more chatty robots. And that's, that's sort of where this could be really useful.